Hello, I'm Pastor Rick, and welcome to our podcast. I hope that the message that you're about to hear will bless and encourage you today. Have you ever read something in the Bible and thought, why is that in there? Or, why did Jesus say that? And you sort of scratch your head. What? Why did Jesus say that? My title this morning, and I've been going with much longer titles, and there's a reason for the long titles. It's because online, when people are looking for a theme, they search by keywords. And the longer my title is, the more those keywords are there. So you, and you know, Christy, who does the artwork, she goes, oh, that's a long title to squeeze in. But it has made a difference in people being able to find the Word of God online. The title this morning is The Hour is Coming. Remember Jesus' three words of warning as we approach the end times. Remember Jesus' three words of warning as we approach the end times. Anytime a major event takes place in the Middle East, especially in Israel, it reminds us that the end of the age is getting closer. We are closer to the return of Jesus Christ today than we were when we met last Sunday or last Wednesday. We are closer to the return of Jesus Christ than we were when I first began to prepare these thoughts. We are closer. And when a major event takes place in Israel, we wonder, Now, according to many end-time scholars, hear this in case you have not been aware of this. According to many end-time scholars, and I also believe this, I wouldn't call myself an end-time scholar, I study the Word, but for those who study the end-time specifically, according to most end-time scholars, hear this, all the prophetic signs leading up to Jesus' appearing and the rapture of the church have been fulfilled as they study the Old and the New Testament and look at the signs that need to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church, end-time scholars say they have all been fulfilled. The next event which awaits the church is the rapture. Now, there are many other end-time prophecies that will be fulfilled after the rapture. And the rapture is that day when we who are followers of Jesus, he appears in the sky, we go up to be with him, the dead in Christ rise, we all go up together. The great catching away is what the rapture is. That is the next major event. And with the conflict in Israel right now, And those of us who have a foundation in the Word of God, we're watching because we know the importance of Israel in the final days before the Lord's return. The world in general does not see through a biblical lens, so that's why people don't quite understand what might be going on or why some people are saying Israel shouldn't be defending themselves or why is Hamas this or why is Hamas that. We know that it's going to focus on Israel. The world does not see Israel as a chosen people of God. They do not understand that what happens in Israel for the believer causes us to lift our heads and wonder, Lord, is this the day? And so, I started working on these thoughts several weeks ago, and I just felt that maybe this would be the Sunday to share them. Possibly you grew up in a church or in a religious setting like I did where the end times weren't spoken about. Some passages from Revelation might have been read. The passages in the Thessalonian epistles might have been read. The book of Daniel might have been read. But this is how I grew up, and I don't know if any of you fall into this category. I grew up in a religious system that said that is so far down the road You don't have to worry about it. There was no teaching regarding the end. There was no teaching regarding watching Israel. None of that took place. 
In fact, it was made out to be that the end times were not that important to us in that church in that time. And there is nothing farther from the truth. The end times, the return of Jesus, the final judgment are not just things of minor importance. Throughout the scripture, they hold a key place. Dr. David Jeremiah, one of those scholars, those end time scholars, says this, in the Old Testament, Christ's return is emphasized in no less than 17 books, and the New Testament authors speak of it in 23 out of the 27 books. Seven out of 10 chapters in the New Testament mention his return. In other words, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teaches us that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. And the Lord himself in the Gospels referred to his return 21 times. This is important. And we need, especially as we watch what appears to be the climax of the end of the age, we need to understand. And we need to follow some of the things that Jesus said. So we're going to look at one of the places in the Gospels that Jesus spoke about his return. He spoke about it 21 times. This is one of them. And there is a verse in our text this morning that is thought-provoking and challenging. It's one of those verses that you scratch your head and say, why did Jesus say that? And I hope to answer that this morning. Now, I'm not going to point out what the verse is. So as I'm reading, I want you to think, hmm, is that the one? Is that the one? Is that the one? That way you'll be engaged. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 20, follow along in your device on a paper Bible or on the screen as I read this passage. Once, this is Jesus now, once I'm being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, There he is, or here he is. Don't go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People will be eating, drinking, marrying, and being given up in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetops with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, and the other left. Now, some of you may have verse 36 in your translation that says two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left just want to let you know many of the newer translations do not have this because the most accurate older manuscripts do not have verse 36. They feel that it was taken from Matthew's writings and inserted into Luke. I just want to let you know that my Bible has verse 36 and it has uh, parentheses around it, but there's nothing there. I find it in the margin. But if your Bible had it and I didn't read it, I wanted to let you know why I skipped it. Um, but I did put it in, uh, in the notes here. So verse 36 says this. It would say in verse 35, two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Now, 
There are probably several different places in this text where you would say, whoa, what did Jesus mean by that? But I'm going to only focus on one verse. And all of my points today contain three words. Now, the shortest verse in the Bible contains two words. Most people have it memorized. That way they could say they've memorized something of the Bible. What is the shortest verse of the Bible? What does it say? Jesus wept. wept. Two words. Well, in our passage today is one of the second shortest verses of the Bible. Three words long. There's about a dozen of these three-word three word English translation verses. One of them is in our text, and it is verse, or point one this morning. And here's what we're going to look at today. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Verse 30 said, It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is, in the housetop, who is on a housetop with possessions inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Remember Lot's wife. What a strange thing for Jesus to say we should remember when he's talking about the end of the age, when he's talking about his coming, when he's talking about the time when two men will be uh, in a bed or two women in a bed, two work in the field, one taken, the other left. Um, uh, 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 an illustration of the rapture. Remember Lot's wife. First of all, there might be some of you who say, who's Lot? And what do we know about his wife? Well, who, who can tell me Lot's wife's name? That's the first thing. What's Lot's wife's name? Salt. What? Salt. <laughs> Salt. <laughs> Lot's wife, is, does, her name is not even mentioned. But Jesus said, when it comes to the time of the end, one thing that you and I and all generations, we're talking thousands of years of church history were to remember Lot's wife. So I think it's important, if we're going to remember her, let's find out what she did or what happened to her. And we find that in the book of Genesis. Now we're going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but notice that Jesus in this passage picked two passages from Genesis, two stories from church history, from, I mean, not church history, from a biblical history, from the history of Israel, two. One is Noah, and the other is Lot, and both of these are judgment stories. The world was judged by a flood in Noah's day. Two cities, actually it was more cities in the plain, were judged in Lot's time. The Lord's judgment fell. At the close of this age, after the rapture, the judgment of God is going to fall upon the earth. And so he said there are two places in the Old Testament where judgment came. And in one of them, the story of Lot, we're to look at one person, Lot's wife, and remember her. So back in Genesis, in chapters 18 and 19, we have the story of Lot. We're not going to read it all. I'm going to encourage you to read it uh, yourself, But this is what happened. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that surrounded them had become so wicked that God determined it was time to send judgment. And the judgment was going to come through fire that fell from the sky. There's an encounter that um, Abraham has with two angels, two messengers that are going to go into the city in which he pleads for the city, and he pleads for any righteous people in the city. Lot is Abraham's nephew. He knew Lot and his family were in the, in, the, uh, in the city. So God said, if we could find X amount of righteous people, I won't destroy the city. Well, it so happened that they didn't. But the two angels that met with Abraham, and also there was a third man that met with Abraham. That was the pre-incarnate Christ. That was God himself who met with Abraham. But the two angels go down to the city. And when they go down to the city, and I won't get into all of the details this morning, when they go down into the city, they find that it is wicked, and they find Lot meets them, and they go to Lot's house. 
And these angels say, listen, Yahweh is going to be destroying these cities because of their wickedness. You must escape. You must flee. Gather your family and your family members. Now, Lot was married and had two daughters. The daughters were engaged to men of Sodom. And they went, and Lot went, and appealed to these men, you need to escape, the city is going to be destroyed. They mocked him, they laughed at him, they said, no, that's not going to happen. Lot, his wife, and the two daughters are in the house, and the angels say, you must leave now. Until you are out of the city, we cannot call the destruction, the judgment, the fire down from heaven. Lot was still hesitant. Finally, they grab his arms and they lead him out of the city and they leave just a few words with them. And that brings us to point two. Point two is this. Don't look back. Here, let's read it in Genesis 19, verse 17 and 26. As soon as they, this is the angels, had brought them out, one of them said... Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But look at verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. That's why John humorously said her name must be Salt, because she became a pillar of salt. Now Jesus said, when we consider the judgment that will come upon planet Earth, when we consider the time of the end, he wanted you to remember, and he said it in three words, remember Lot's wife. What did Lot's wife do? The only thing that she did that was different than Lot and the daughters, they all left the city, she disobeyed the command of the angels, and she turned and she looked back, and instantly she became a pillar of salt. So if we're going to learn anything from this passage, if we're going to heed Jesus' words about what we need to pay attention to now that the end times are drawing closer and closer and closer to the time when Jesus will appear, we need to remember Lot's wife. We don't look back because that's what she did so let me see if i can unpack this for a moment the warning don't look back came from the angels it was a word from god so why did she look back this is where i think the holy spirit has been speaking to me and can speak to you can speak to all of us. Why did she look back? First thing is, was it curiosity? Did she want to see what it must have looked like for the fire of heaven to be falling? I don't think it was curiosity. I don't think she was just curious. Because I don't believe Jesus is warning us about being curious. As I studied this text, as I prayed over this text, as I've heard what others have said about this text, here is what I, was, what I believe was taking place. When Lot's wife was running for her life with her husband and daughters, she turned around. She looked back with a sense of longing and loss for what she had to lose in following the Lord. She had a direct word from God through these angels. Not only did she have a direct word from God, that word was delivered powerfully by two angels. They forced her out of the city, and as she is running, this word from God is beginning to, fall, uh, to be fulfilled around they're running and the fire from heaven is coming down it's happening she knew it was a word from god but she looked back here's a couple of statements for you not on the screen but you may want to think about these 
Lot's wife looked back because even though her body was out of Sodom, her heart was not. She was losing her home, her friends, other family that might have been there, certainly the potential son-in-laws for her daughters. All of her possessions she was losing, except for what she had on her back or in her hands. Her identity was being lost as being the wife of someone important in the city. You say, what do you mean? She was important, or his, her husband was important. When the angels meet up with Lot, he's in the city gates. The city gates in Old Testament times were kind of the city council. It is where the leaders sat and where transactions took place. This is where her husband was. So he was prominent in the city. She was going to lose that prominence. They were going to escape with nothing but the clothes on their back and what they carried. Her attachment to her past was greater than her commitment to the future that God was calling her and the family to. She wanted what she had more than what God had for her. She was attached to the things of that life. It was deep within her heart. And as she is escaping for her life, I don't know if it was just a glance or a full turnaround, but as soon as she looked back, and the Lord knew why she looked back, she became salt. Her life ended in that moment. And her husband and daughters continued to escape to the mountain. And Jesus said, people of God, my church, those of you that follow me, as the end gets close, remember Lot's wife. Remember. Don't turn back. You say, what do you mean turn back? I don't know that it's a physically turning back, but let me throw some ideas out to you. How important are your possessions? How important are your relationships? How important is your family and extended family? And I'm not saying any of these things shouldn't be important, but how important are they in light of how important Jesus is? Because as the end comes, life is going to get much more difficult. And for some, Possibly a lot of us, because Jesus makes a big deal, remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. It will be a stumbling block. It will be something that will keep us from fully serving the Lord. And as it gets farther and farther, closer to the time when Jesus returns, it's going to be harder and harder to live for him until the day of the rapture. And this isn't the first time that Jesus warned about following him and looking back. Earlier in Luke's gospel, in chapter 9, these words are recorded, going to come up on the screen. Another person said to Jesus, "Um, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What did he want to do? He wanted to go back to his old wife, life. He wanted to take care of things. Jesus said, no, if you're going to follow me, it's forward. You're not looking over your shoulder. You're not in and out. You move forward. He said, if you put your hand to the plow, which means you're going to serve the Lord, and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. I'm not fit for the kingdom. And the draw of the world, the draw of stuff, the draw of entertainment, the draw of relationships, the draw of possession, the draw of prestige, the draw of relationships will at times cause us to begin to turn and look back. And Jesus said, don't look back. No one 
who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. When persecution rises because of following Jesus, will you stand and keep following? When friends leave you, when family pressures you to stop being so religious, when your boss overlooks you for promotion because you followed Jesus, will you stand and keep following? When your own children who are not in the kingdom right now are encouraging you to spend more time with them or the grandkids, which is taking you out of the house of God, taking you out of your time with the Lord, are you going to stand and follow? When religious and spiritual people tell you that you don't have to be so radical in your faith to be a follower of Jesus, will you stand and keep following? My next two points, and they're on the note sheet, and I got them indented just a little bit for you, are a little bit of an aside, but I want to make sure that we get this across. We will not be here when the judgment, we will not be here for the judgment of God when that falls. There's a lot of people that say, well, when God's wrath is poured, will we be here? No. Jesus will have taken us in the rapture. But before the rapture, I expect that things will get worse and worse for real followers of Jesus. We've had it good here in the West. But some of our brothers, sisters in other parts of the world, such as right now in the Middle East, well, they're suffering for Jesus. When a Jew accepts Jesus as Messiah, a lot of times they are totally cut off from the community. When a Muslim accepts Jesus as their Lord, they are cut off from the community. They are suffering right now. That's not judgment. That's not the time of the end. That's just the reality of following Jesus. And we in the West, because we, this nation was founded with biblical and moral principles, are not feeling it. But have you noticed a shift? Have you felt the shift? Have you felt it on your job? Have you felt it amongst your friends? No, we will not be here for the judgment of God when it, fall, when it falls, but we will be here for the persecution of people. You say, oh, no, we won't. Oh, look what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I just need to warn you. When persecution comes, it's very probable it has nothing to do with how you're living for God. It's probably because you are living for God. Yeah, but I don't like persecution. Nobody does. But if you don't accept the fact that as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ... Persecution will come. It can really throw you to the point that I believe that some, when persecution gets severe, that's when they're going to turn back. Because as they begin to turn back and they are not so radical for Jesus and they kind of just blend in with the culture, the persecution will disappear. And Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. This is an interesting statement that dropped into my heart. I'm going to share it with you because I believe the Holy Spirit dropped it. Okay, so just pay attention. Those of you at home, what's the best thing that happened to you this year? What's the best thing that happened to you this year? Did you buy a house? Did you get a new car or boat? Did you finally end up in that relationship? Did your job finally get to the place that you have been wanting it to for a long time? What's the best thing that happened to you this year? Now, what if following Jesus puts that in jeopardy? Think about it. What if following Jesus puts that in jeopardy? What if following Jesus means you will lose this thing? Will you Look back. There's been some great things that have happened in our lives. 
There's some great things Sherry and I are looking forward to. Should Jesus' return be delayed, we're moving into that season that people call retirement. <laughs> That's exciting. If we don't get there and Jesus comes, no problem. If we get there and experience it for two days or two weeks, no problem. Because I'm moving on. I'm looking forward to the day that I'm going to be with my Savior in heaven. But we've been making plans. We've got some possible trips planned. We've got some things that are kind of exciting. We've got some things that I've been looking forward to. There's some things we're going to do together. If that was jeopardized because of following Jesus... I would be disappointed, but I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm not going to look back. I'm moving on. But for you, young person, what exciting has happened this year? Did you get engaged? Did you get a new iPhone or a new Galaxy? I mean, for some people, that's the highlight of their year. What if that got jeopardized? if you were following Jesus, would you still move forward? The last point isn't from this text, but it's, a, it's from another text. And number three this morning is this. We're to remember Lot's wife. We don't look back, and we need to always be ready. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus said, So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. You must be ready at all times, at all times. Martin Luther, this statement is attributed to him. He said this, I will live as if Christ died yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is coming back tomorrow. That's the way we should live. He's coming back tomorrow. We hold loosely, lightly to the things of this world, and we hold tightly to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? You're to always be ready. It bothers me when I hear of people that are getting their life really together when things begin to take place in the world, such as in Israel. All of a sudden, oh, I better get my life back together. No, you're to always be ready. As a matter of fact, you won't know the day or the hour. This conflict in Israel, it may stir us it may wake some of us up but jesus was very clear in the days of noah no one knew that that was the day that the rain was going to come they were doing business they were having parties they were getting married they were getting engaged they were having babies life went on as normal and then the lord closed the ark and the rains came in sodom and gomorrah everything was the same as it had been the day before. There were parties. There were engagements. There were people who were doing business deals until Lot and his family left the city and the judgment of God fell. That's what the world is going to be like when Jesus returns and takes us home. He loves you. He loves me. But he wants you to always be ready and to be living as if he's going to come back tomorrow. The team can make their way to the platform. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you fully facing forward, meaning are you facing Jesus? Are you facing the kingdom? Are you walking towards him? Are you fully facing forward, walking forward, seeking the things of God? Or this morning, do you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom? If you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, I want to tell you that's another way of saying you're looking back. You're divided. And Jesus said, don't look back. Remember Lot's wife. She not only lost it all when judgment came, but because she lost back, because she looked back, she also lost any future she would have if she would have only kept looking forward. This morning, God loves you. God loves you. 
His desire is for you to spend eternity with Him in His kingdom. Will you? This morning, maybe you grew up religious. You kind of go to church. Maybe you go to church somewhat regularly. But this devoted relationship, this radical relationship that I've kind of described, looking forward, not looking back, not having one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, that sort of describes you today. The Holy Spirit is saying, will you today give your life fully to Jesus? Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you that are viewing online, you've never done that either. Listen, God loves you. Jesus came, died for your sins, and he is offering a free gift to you today. The free gift of forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life. But he's also offering that to you if you've been looking back, if you've had one foot in the world and one in the kingdom, and today you're willing to say, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. No turning back again. That's you this morning in just a few moments. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus for the first time or to return and give your heart fully to Jesus. Let's not look back, folks. Let's not look back. Would you stand? Lord, I don't know who might be watching, who might be listening, who might be here in the building. That as I've been talking about those three words that Jesus shared, remember Lot's wife. That they see themselves as someone who could very probably look back if their status was threatened or their possessions were threatened or their relationships were threatened. And Lord, only you can reveal who that might be. But Lord, I know that you love each person and you're calling them to this devoted, radical relationship with you, not because you want to restrict them, but because you want them to have life and to have it more abundantly. Lord, as we sing this old song, I believe there's some hearts that are going to be stirred. Let them be stirred, not just by the emotion of the song, but by your Holy Spirit. So that if some need to either give their life to Jesus for the first time or recommit, they will do it before this service ends. Pray in Jesus' name. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. Again, the world behind me will cross before me. The world behind me.
Lord, we stand here being challenged, Lord God. This morning, if what I have been sharing, the Holy Spirit has taken that and moved upon your heart and you recognize that you have been looking back to the world, you have been seeking that more than seeking Jesus, or that you don't have a relationship with Jesus right now while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, would you identify yourself to me so I know who I'm praying for? If this morning you wish to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, or you're saying, I'm divided, I'm looking back, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus without turning back, would you slip your hand up right now, wherever you are, slip your hand up. Yes, anybody else this morning? Anybody else? Thank you. You may lower your hands. Anybody else? This is you this morning. At home, if this is you, you don't have to lift your hand, but you could just say under your breath, yeah, that's me, Pastor. That's me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and then we're going to return to this song. If you lifted your hand this morning, if you should have lifted your hand this morning, given your heart to Jesus, or you are dedicating yourself to the cross, and the world is going to remain behind you. Repeat these words. Jesus, I'm going to just ask everybody to pray out loud. That way those who are praying it will not have to feel that attention has been drawn to them. So church, everybody pray this. Say, Jesus, I recognize that I am not a true follower. I'm not really dedicated and devoted to you but I want to be. I want the words. I have decided to follow Jesus to be my life's mission. And there will be no turning back. I give you my heart. I give you my life. And I receive from you grace, forgiveness, your love, and eternal life. I receive it. It is a free gift. I don't deserve it. There's nothing I can do to earn it. But I receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer at home, would you send us a text, an email, maybe drop something in the comments. We're going to uh, close our feed right now, but we're going to remain here in the sanctuary. There's a prayer time coming. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh Thanks for joining us for this message from Columbus First Assembly. If this message has blessed you in any way, would you share it on your social media feeds so that others can be blessed also? If you would like to join us for an in-person service and you're close to us, we are in Columbus, Indiana, then uh, our services start at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings and our church is located on the corner of 10th and Iowa. Once again, thanks for joining us. Look forward to having you join us again soon.